All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 19th day, Sunday, in the year of our Lord, 19th day of June, in the year of our Lord, 2022. Getting a little ahead of myself there. Yes, um, and I'm not going to church today because I'm not going to participate in a Father's Day celebration. Not because Father's Day is particularly evil, although it has been turned into just another excuse to make money. As, you know, the love of money is the root of all manner of evil, and it corrupts everything in America, it seems, including religion, including Christianity, <sighs> including uh, Christian YouTube sites. Yeah. See, see, once you start arranging, even subconsciously, Ministers, pastors have this temptation all the time. Usually not conscious, because when it becomes conscious, you reject it. But as long as it's not conscious, you don't realize what's going on. The, the uh, uh, Adjusting your message to make sure you don't offend the wealthy donors in the church. Uh, yeah, uh, failing to preach the truth of the Scripture... Because in, as it is, because it might offend someone, and that might affect donations. And you will offend people just speaking what the Bible says. Some people will say amen. And when you're clearly proclaiming the Bible, those people, you should mark them as God's saints. <laughs> those who uh, complain about it, and give you reasons why they complain about it, and they're not biblical reasons, you could mark them as being more or less worldly. But yeah, you, you, if, if you are seeking to please the wealthy donors, you're not the servant of God. That's like Paul said, if I'm seeking to please men, then I would not be the servant of Christ. Anyway, I was thinking about uh, the non-participation, right? I didn't want to make a fuss about it. It's a rel relatively small thing, but I think the the, uh, the need to maintain the the uh, the holiness of the assembly of the saints, to, the, that it's set apart to Christ. And we ought not mix the things of this world with it, even those that might appear wholesome. Disney once appeared wholesome. You know, the things we grew up with that were regarded as wholesome then, they're probably not now. But uh, how do we respond to that um, in a Christian way that's consistent with Christian love, uh, both uh, the love for the brother and the love for the Lord, uh, not and, and Christ, try, trying to dwell it with peace with the brethren and with all men? Well, it, it occurred to me, well, the best thing, as I considered it, I said, I don't really want to make a fuss about it. It's not a terribly big thing. But I think it's important that we guard the, uh, the, the holiness of the, the assembly of the saints to, to try to turn, not let it get into corruption like it is so, so many places. And it's sort of like a mild protest without having to say anything. And if somebody asks, well, you know, not stomping out. I've done that in my younger days. Uh, there's things in the worship service that I simply don't like. I don't think it's um, uh, some of the music in the chorus book. As soon as they, the little blue chorus book. I don't like that music. 
it comes from Pentecostals, charismatic generally anyway, and it's mindless, repetitious goo, often. Um, and some Christians love it, but I simply do not feel compelled to sing it. It's like, okay, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at it, but I'm not going to enthusiastically sing it. I'm just going to not participate in music. That it, Sometimes a, a new hymn, too. If there's a hymn and I'm not familiar with it, I'll look at it and say, I don't know about this. I'll look at the content, at the words. And if I don't think it's, it's biblically consistent, I mean, it's it, that it's pretty far off that it's, that it's glorifying man or uh, has a... Uh, a twist to the gospel message that's not right, that it, it, it points to God or to man and not to Christ. Well, one one a, a, a song in the the hymn book at the church I used to serve at in Bismarck here, quite a while ago now, back in the late nineties, was uh, they loved the song "Little Brown Church in the Vale," or something like that. And I, you know, because at one time I thought, well, I realized having, letting a pianist that hadn't, that was sort of new to the church pick the songs was not a good idea. So I, uh, one of the things I did for fairly soon when I came there was I asked the uh, the congregation to, to just write on a piece of paper their favorite hymns. So it'd have me, uh, it'd give me an, uh, a guide, and then I'd go through those and say, "Well, you yeah, know, this this is okay, and this is okay." You know, biblically, I, th I think music is, if it's supposed to be part of worship of God, it better be biblical, right? And a little brown church in the veil and some other songs and hymn books simply are not biblical, <laughs> and they should be not part of worship. And just because something is popular and Christians like it doesn't mean... The, the, see, the job of the pastor is to, to lead the sheep into green meadows and still waters, still pure waters. You don't want the sheep to eat loco weed, and you don't want the sheep to drown in the raging torrent. So... Uh, and it's not coer to do that in a non-coercive way because just sort of like, well, you know, and, and explain why. That, that because this is supposed to be about glorifying God, glorifying Christ, worshiping Christ. Shouldn't Christ be the focus of what we do, everything we do? Because he's our fellowship. You know, it's, it's like, what is a fellowship dinner? We need to consider these things. I think some people have thought about these things, but how do you fix it? Especially, a pastor has a little more, well, I don't know. I don't think a pastor has any more ability. Sometimes I think a, a person in the congregation has more, well, I know, the, a person in the congregation has more freedom of action than the pastor. All you have to do is sometimes just suggest something. I mean, if it's, and trust the Holy Spirit to, if it is of God, then he will convince his people. But when you try to tell people what to do, then, you know, there's that automatic recoil response, especially that Americans have, called rebellion. <laughs> of course, if it's, you know, you're not an authority, so, you know, take it or leave it. And I was thinking about the, the best response to this, uh, considering, especially since it's not something that's worthy of a public rebuke or anything like that. I mean, it, that would be making a mountain out of a molehill. It hasn't gone that far. But it, it's not good to encourage things that you can see they're not actually headed in the right direction. It's the, the small things sometimes, the small sins, the small um, deviations from the purity of God and his worship that can gradually lead us farther and farther away. And I am not uh, claiming innocence or holiness or anything in this. I'm just saying, you know, I've been a Christian for 46 years, not counting the uh, 21 years 
of being a baptized Christian in addition to that, uh, before that, a born-again Christian. And I've seen the direction that many things have, have taken. And there's a reason to be concerned. But I also see that when you try to, if you, if you amplify the small things, because you can see where this is headed, but you have to realize that most people won't. So what do you do? What do you do? How can you maintain peace and love of the brethren? So you care for what's going on. You care for God. You care for your brothers and sisters. You're concerned. But you also don't do it. And how do you act in such a way as to maintain the peace also? And I was thinking non-participation. Just don't participate in that. So the, just like I've, you know, with the, uh, the choruses. I just don't like those things. Uh, or I'll look at the author and I'll say, that's a charismatic. I don't like his, his, I don't want anybody to think this guy is someone they should listen to and follow. So it was popular. So I used to sing it back in the, the Jesus Revolution days or the, the coffee house days, the youth ministry days when I used to go to a youth ministry, uh, a coffee house thing. And you sort of got into that stuff back when I didn't know anything yet. <laughs> And I didn't, couldn't see the outcomes. That it was, uh, you know, it, it, not necessarily evil, but not really wholesome and honoring of Christ. Just like the uh, one time at uh, the Baptist Church, the Southern Baptist Church, I was a pastor at for a short time down in the Rio Grande Valley, I mentioned a song, a popular Christian song, is an example of what was so bad. And it was, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, 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 Lord, repeat, 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 on uh, ad infinitum. And it was just like, this is the most contentless garbage I've ever heard. <laughs> it, it, it is, it puts your mind to utter sleep. And I understand, yes, we should be saying yes to lo to the Lord, but you've got to have some context there. <laughs> Who's the Lord, too? It was just mindless repetition, which is choruses. I mean, so often the charismatic choruses that are so popular, the garbage. <laughs> I mean, really, con they have no content compared to the, the great old hymns. And I pointed out in church uh, not too long ago, I, I, I don't think I was preaching that day, too. I just pointed out to the congregation that in the Nazarene hymn book, and I, my, new, my here is newer than theirs, but I checked theirs when I got there to make sure, they actually have a hymn that dates to 800 A.D. Uh, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, I believe is the title of it. Ancient hymn. And I said, there's no such thing as contemporary Christianity. As Wesley said, if it's new, it's not true. <laughs> Always fun to use Wesley once in a while, especially when he serves your purpose. That that's true, Wesley's point. And, and if it's, and if it's uh, not true, or if it's if it's true, it's not new. And he was correct. What he was saying is basically the, talking about the faith delivered once for all to the saints. That's how you have to interpret that. Whether or not that was context, I don't know. But the idea, of course, if the faith, the entire faith, the Christian faith, was delivered to the saints in the first century, then we have it in the scriptures. Everything that comes after that, that's not in the scriptures, taught in the scriptures, is not true. It's a corruption, which is like 90% of Roman Catholicism, perhaps. <sighs> yeah, if it's not taught in the scriptures, and sometimes they're they're they directly contradict the scriptures, like idolatry. Well, that's not idolatry. We're not actually worshiping these images. We're just venerating them. Yeah. Hmm. Do you think God agrees with that? See, Roman Catholics will say, well, we're not actually worshiping the image. We're worshiping the, the deity that it represents. <laughs> well, that's what the pagans did. 
We're just a, mean, a means of communication to, to point your mind toward the, and heart toward the, the, the spirit that it represented. It's called idolatry. The pagans don't believe the statue is the god itself. Not physically. Uh, anyway, uh, I I think that uh, so I was thinking non-participation, and my thoughts began to extend that. And I held for quite a while. I was holding uh, throughout my Christian life until 2016. I was I I didn't vote. I generally didn't participate in that. I didn't think that politics really can accomplish anything for the kingdom of God. And my position was actually the historic evangelical position, the old evangelical position, the Bible-believing position. Up until Jerry Falwell Sr. and his moral majority movement, sometimes, I think it was in the early 80s or maybe late 70s, where he, uh, you know, to save America from pornography. I think the idea came from his daughter. I said, Daddy, why aren't we doing anything about this? Well, you shouldn't listen to your daughter. You should listen to God. So he, uh, Jerry Falwell, who was a fundamental Baptist of, of sorts, who later joined the Southern Baptists, uh, he, uh, Old Time Gospel Hour was the name of the show. Well, it wasn't really a show. It was his church. It was, you know, one of the actual church service broadcasts that just have a certain television orientation to them. Well, he uh, he built this coalition, not strictly Christian, moral majority, as if there was a moral majority. Well, it should be clear now, there is no moral majority in America. America has never been a Christian country, and America has never been a moral country. Not biblical morality. Not godliness. There has been a form of morality, a, a superficial form, but if it was never allowed to get in the way of what people call progress, you know, like the the Native Americans, the uh, the care, the Christian concern with the Native Americans never was allowed to get in the way of removing them from their land, so we could take it. That's been America's history all over the world. You go back to sending the Marines in, I think this was in the early part of the 20th century, if not the only time, into Latin America uh, to defend the interests of the American Fruit Company, later known as Dole, D-O-L-E, the American Fruit Company. They sent the Marines in to secure the fruit company from the government wanting to tax it or something like that. American corporate profits are the transcendent, transcendent value when it comes to the American federal government. So what do you do with that? The old evangelical position before Jerry Falwell was that politics was a dirty business and Christians ought not entangle themselves in it. You go back to uh, Charles Finney, which is not a good uh, representative of the gospel. Uh, his idea of holiness was uh, uh, superficial. But it was also that you don't involve yourself in fashions, you don't involve yourself in the things of this world, including and especially politics. It's a dirty compromise you know, the Bible tells us to come out from among that those things to be separate. So, uh, anyway, th that's my biblical understanding of not Finney, but the Bible. And I want to look at some verses uh, to just a, just three sections of the Scripture. But the idea of non-participation, non-entanglement, we could say, in the uh, things of this world, especially things that maybe offend our conscience. Not necessarily, t not taking up arms, not necessarily screaming and hollering about it, but simply not taking part in it. And so I, I searched on YouTube. I was wondering if anybody had done any videos on that. So I 
put in Christian non-participation. And I found out there's no such thing as artificial intelligence at Google. I did not get one coherent recommendation that made any sense at all. We have nothing to fear from AI, unless it's the fact that it is man's recreation of a reprobate mind, a mind already under the judgment of God. Of course, they model it after their own thinking, so clone themselves. <sighs> it used to be you, you would do an internet search and you got meaningful results. I don't think they're actually censoring. They're just selecting non-meaningful responses. Non-meaningful suggestions that have nothing to do with the question. So much for artificial intelligence. You can't have it anyway. It's, it's, it's just a, a delusion. It just has the appearance of... Uh, intelligence, not the reality of it. Now, let's look at uh, some scriptures to see if what I think my course of action. Well, it, it satisfies the love of the brother, I think, and it satisfies uh, maintaining peace in the assembly and living at peace with all men. I mean, if you, uh, it's just like. Uh, you know, the, the leftists and everything else that are constantly screaming and hollering and protesting. Well, if you simply don't participate in some of these things, they will just ignore you. You're not relevant. Uh, stick to preaching the gospel. Okay, and on YouTube, I'm not talking to non-believers here. I'm talking to people that regard themselves as Christians generally. So, anybody else is just incidental. <laughs> what do they call that? Uh, um, collateral damage. Collateral damage to the world, perhaps. So here, which is good. <laughs> uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 12. Starting at verse 12. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Oh, he's talking to them about the Pharisees' tradition about uh, eating with wa unwashed hands and things like that. That were nothing to do with the, the law of Moses, just Pharisaical, rabbinical expansions of such things. The, Pharise the rabbis, the Pharisees, had this idea that if they expanded the law out from where it is, that would prevent people from accidentally breaking it. In other words, establish new commandments that went way farther than God did to keep people from accidentally breaking the law. Well, there were sacrifices for accidental violation, none for deliberate. So what the Pharisees actually did was nullify the law in the process. They replaced God's word with their own. The traditions of the elders. that, And then they claim that it was secret tradition given to Moses, not written. God would have had it written down if God had said it. See, the Rome claim, makes the same claims, by the way, about their traditions. And I'm sure Orthodoxy does the same thing. They don't believe in a completed scripture, in a faith delivered once for all unto the saints. They don't. Even if they would verbally affirm it, they, would, they still don't believe it. It's just like uh, Pentecostals don't believe it. Charismatics don't believe it. That's why they're always seeking new words, fresh words, because they think God's scriptures, his words, have a shelf life. Used by such and such a date, or by a find a new one. That kind of, no. Jesus answered, you know, his, his disciples, Hey, Lord, you offended the Pharisees. And Jesus' answer was, so? That was his intent, to offend their false traditions. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up, uprooted, pulled. They're weeds. Their traditions are nothing but weeds. 
They're not my father's work. It's going to be rooted up. So all the traditions of man, all the governments of man, all the things of this world are going to be uprooted, overthrown. That all, everything my Heavenly Father has not planted. Satan's work in the garden is being overthrown. Jesus Christ did everything necessary to do that. So it's going to be uh, all the traditions of the elders, all church traditions, all the things that God has not delivered to us. It's going to be uprooted. Let them alone. Hmm. Don't go try to convince them. It's inter I find this a very interesting scripture. We're told to love the brethren. We're told to, 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 to uh, love our neighbors. We're told to, to love God. But yet Jesus tells his disciples to leave the Pharisees alone in their false traditions. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Now, how is this loving the brother? Apparently, we're not understanding something right. Jesus is very clear here. Here are people that are supposed to be part of God's people. They're of God's covenant. They are uh, the, the neighbors in the Old Testament law. And Jesus says, leave them. Leave them alone. Leave them in their darkness and deception. Think about that. We see that in the New Testament farther when, in, in the Acts and in the uh, epistles or Paul and Peter, they go out and they preach the gospel. And those who received the word, they would gather together. But the others would quickly become hardened, and they would just let them go. They would receive the, the, the believers and take them apart and disciple them. And those that didn't want the gospel, they just left them. They didn't keep going back after them, harassing them, concerned about them. They just left that in God's hands. Let them alone. They reject the gospel. Let them alone. They are the blind leaders of the blind. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you still without understanding? <laughs> hey, Peter, you're not it. Now Jesus didn't say that. But that's the implication. Peter... Jesus often said things like that. Uh, think of all the time Jesus said, Oh, ye of little faith. They had some faith, just not very much. They had faith for some things, but not for others. Only what was within their range of possibilities. Oh, God can do that, but God can't do that kind of stuff, you know. So do we. So many Christians have faith that God will guide the doctor. But somehow God can't do it without the doctor. Did it for 6,000 years without the doctors. <sighs> that would be an interesting study. Actually, they've done it, was it in the state of Oregon or Washington, where they did a study of uh, medical, of health of poor people, under Medicaid, and those that did not, that simply with, went without medical care, were actually healthier than those that did, that got that did the Medicaid thing and went to the doctors and everything. Now, I'm not saying that that study is conclusive because it could have been self-selection. The healthy people didn't want to bother with the doctors because they didn't need them. But we have people that go to the doctors habitually when there's nothing wrong with them. What are they, rendering worship to their idols or what? There's an old saying in America that I learned from my dad. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, boys, they want to take everything apart, and they think they can fix anything. They have no idea what they're doing, but they'll take it apart. They might not be able to put it together again, but they can't, they'll take it apart. They want to see how it works. 
what my dad say. If it ain't broke, don't fix it because you're apt to break it and make it worse when you engage in unnecessary uh, uh, fixing. Fix the engine so it, you know, Tim Taylorize it, make it more powerful, adjust the carburetor, advance the spark, break the motor. <laughs> Not designed to run that way. You have to leave it the way God uh, would have it, you know. And of course, man designs motors, but you try to fix things, they'll come back and bite you. Uh, Monsanto modifying, genetically modifying, uh, Soybeans and other things. Uh, ecological disaster for the world. It just hasn't thoroughly bit anybody yet. Other than some farmers that got sued by Monsanto. When Monsanto's uh, let this their, their genes loose in the world. It gets into other people's crops. And then they sue the farmer for... Uh, having uh, plants that have the Monsanto patented gene. Well, Monsanto didn't keep their pollen in check. Talk about, and the courts sided with Monsanto. The courts are thoroughly corrupt. They, 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 unlike, God says, do not show respect to the poor or to the powerful. They don't get to have a bigger say because they're a huge corporation. This is America. This is not a land of justice. Do not be deceived by the propaganda. Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? See, on clean food, Jesus is saying, in fact, uh, Mark here says, in parentheses, by this he pronounced all foods clean. In other words, what you eat, and he, uh, we'll read the rest here, does not contaminate you, does not make you unrighteous. It's not what goes into your mouth. Now let me let Jesus say this. That's better. Do, not, do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated out the other end? But those things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. It's not a spiritual, you know, the, uh, Islam needs to really get a hold of this because Islam is really heavy. They're just like the Pharisees. In fact, they were probably influenced by the Pharisees. Uh, Muhammad, if he existed, was influenced by um, corrupted, thoroughly corrupted Christianity and Jewish traditions, things from the Talmud. So Jesus says about the Pharisees that were teaching these things, leave them alone. They're the blind leading the blind. Okay, so don't participate with them. Don't bother arguing with them. Just leave them alone. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 19. And a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. If you're looking for a nice, comfortable office, or a nice, comfortable dwelling place, or a permanent place, you, know, you, you, you can't follow me. You, you can't take stuff with you. We don't have RVs. At the end of the night, I don't have an established dwelling place to go lay my head in. We might be sleeping out under the stars or under the clouds, under the rain, under the snow. We don't have 
I don't have an abode here. You going to follow me? Are you ready for it? Is your personal comfort more important than I am? And another of the disciples said to him, See, these are people following him. Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Boy, has this been mutilated. I often hear preachers say, well, what's he saying is he's not saying that Jesus isn't going to let him go and bury his dead father. No, uh, the man wants to wait until his father dies, and then he'll come follow Jesus. That's not what the text says, okay? You don't have to make excuses for Jesus. See, it's they're trying to soften the words. Oh, Jesus wouldn't be so unreasonable to tell a person to just not take care of his dead father, get him in the ground. See, in Jewish tradition, they were supposed to be buried the same day. Yeah, just like in Muslim tradition today. They're supposed to be buried the same day. But Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. Allow unbelievers, those that aren't disciples of me, aren't following me, they can take care of it. The dead who aren't interested in the Savior and God's salvation, they can clean up the mess. They can bury the dead. Hard choice. Break tradition. Jesus is what? Demanding that he be more important than everything else. If you don't understand that, don't follow him. Don't follow him if there are things that push comes to shove. You have to make a choice that you'll choose the other rather than Christ. Don't follow him if you haven't counted the cost. Now, everyday life, we usually don't have to make these kind of choices. And actually, I find the hard choices easy. It's Christ or this. There's no compromise. No, it's the daily things where, well, I can this and this. This isn't really against Christ, and I can do this. I like this. I like that. And it's not obvious. It's not necessarily wrong. It's not necessarily right. But those things can slowly creep up on you and sort of take over your life if you're not careful. And you have to be willing. When the Lord opens your eyes and says, no, this is cutting in to your devotion to me, your time with me, your love for me. And I know that you think you're doing this other thing out of love for me, but it's taking over your life. See, like a ministry or a, a being a pastor, that can take over and become more important the Lord, the Lord Jesus. Even that which is good has to be second to Christ. So is it good to bury your father? Yes. But Christ is part of the law. Honor your father and mother. But when the author of the law, when God himself is here with the, the Lord of salvation, and he says, follow me. It's his law. You follow him. Because you have a command from him. From God. Personally. So to obey the, the letter of the law and disobeying the author of the law... When Jesus is saying, no, following me is more important than keeping that commandment. Because that commandment, you know, if you're not honoring me, not following me, that everything else is ridiculous, is, is meaningless. Meaningless. Honoring your father and mother does not supersede your loyalty to Christ. 
And when you start obeying the law uh, and rejecting Christ, you've really missed the boat. So one other scripture. You know, the problem with this is I actually have no limits on YouTube times. <laughs> what was I going to look at next? One more short thing. This is John, 1 John, the Apostle John, the, the one that Jesus loved, the brother of James, the writer of the book of Revelation. If your church or your pastor says that John didn't write the book of Revelation, well, you need to find a different church. There are p teachers that teach all kinds of garbage, pastors that teach all kinds of trash. When uh, th 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 those are people you need to flee from, flee from the wolves. To so the pastor that loves to talk about money and loves to talk about tithing, uh, and puts uh, pressure on the congregation to give, 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 flee, flee. He's a lover of money, not a lover of Christ. A true pastor will seek not to burden the church which ex with expenses. In other words, you'd actually see, if, you know, who need, you know, when they talk, oh, we need to, uh, like a local church here where they spent untold hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'd have to guess, but it had to be hundreds of thousands to remodel a perfectly good church. Not even that old. Just because they wanted to conform to the modern, uh, seeker-sensitive, uh, youth-oriented thing that it was a, and so far as to it was an amphitheater type, you know, with the the sort of drop down to the platform as you went into the sanctuary, and they actually filled that up, hired contractors come in, and this this is a church that seats hundreds of people. Uh, fairly large, and fill that, you know, to fill that and then pour concrete over the top means you have to bring pretty good sized equipment in there in the building to do all that. That would be a very expensive operation just to, to level the floor. For what purpose? None. Thinking that by conforming to a certain image, of what's being promoted as a, a church design that'll attract the, the young and the worldly. That's what it was for. They tore out a couple classrooms and replaced it with a coffee and pasta bar, or not pasta, a, a donut world bar or something like that. They don't sell it, but so you can, you know, lots of churches had like a back of the church or in the basement you know, have a coffee or maybe a donut and before the service or you can go down there and f talk with your with other people and do that but that's not they, they know they actually remove classrooms see the, the the odd thing about this is this is a nazarene church and historically nazarenes would not even entertain the idea of having food in the sanctuary so generally, Nazarene churches will build a separate building as a fellowship dining hall for non-worship-related functions. You go to most Nazarene churches, you'll see that. And I always thought that was a little odd. Uh, most churches would have, you know, like the basement, something like that, you'd have... have uh, tables. Now, obviously, eating in the pews is probably not the best idea anyway, but but the, the idea the idea was, oh, no, that's, that's separate. That's set aside for God's worship. It's a holy place. There's no such thing as a holy place other than it being set aside for God's worship. It's, it, it's not intrinsically holy. But the idea that a church where they historically always had a separate structure for eating fellowship, eating, meals, stuff like that, non-worship, would tear out classrooms and build a thing in the building right next to the sanctuary itself. Like, okay. 
uh, not very Nazarene, but then they probably don't call themselves Nazarene. Oh, I did notice they sort of changed their name. It's They emphasize First Church now. And then a tiny print underneath on the sign, it says, Of the Nazarene. Of the Nazarene. We're, in other words, we're no longer a holiness church. I can remember, I don't know what church it was, but there used to be a, one of the churches around here had a banner in the front. And this was pretty common. And it's a slogan from the old days. It's, Holiness unto the Lord. It's a quote from the Old Testament. They'll write on their hands, Holiness unto the Lord, to remind themselves who they belong to. And the prophets. The day will come to pass when they will inscribe on their hands, Holiness unto the Lord. To remind you who you actually belong to. And you're, you're about to use your hand for something. No, that's, that belongs to the Lord. <sighs> so, Jesus, well, here, let's get the scripture. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. This is John, 1 John 2, sorry, verse 15. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Not talking about the earth, talking about the world system of man here, using the word cosmos in that sense. Or if you were to love even that above God. Creation is to be loved only in the sense that it is a display of God's power and existence. It's not God. It's not God. It's the Creator we are to love. For all that is in the world. Now, now John here, the, the word uh, cosmos has a number of meanings, and the Scripture always clarifies in context what's being meant. So, so, so all that is in the cosmos, the word John is using, let me make sure of that. Cosmos, yes, because there's all over words, words that are translated that way too. Um, all that is in the cosmos, in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the world of fallen Adam, in other words. The lust of the flesh, the, the strong desire of the flesh, of the eyes, and of the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he that does the will of God abides forever. Do not love the world or the things of the world. John, uh, James says uh, that, talking about uh, the same issue, those who would be friends with the world, who desire to be friends with the world. You've heard of friendship evangelism? See, people often do, Christians often do what's right in their own sight, right in their own mind, rather than what the Word of God says. They, they do not take instruction from the Word of God. And even when you point out to them what they're doing is contrary to the Word of God, of a, obvious violation of what God has said, they don't care. I remember one young man that said to me, I, I questioned him. He was talking about joining the military, and I raised some issues with that because I had been saved while I was in the military. I, I left. I found, saw it was it's inconsistent. I don't condemn people that are... I just have to say uh, that if you're in the military now, you really want to be serving Joey and, and his son, Hunter, and you really know what America is doing around the world. Do you really want to know what America is doing around the world? Or are you just doing what's right in your own eyes? Uh, it's easier not to get in the military than it is to, to get out of the military, too. I got out of it I, with an honorable discharge. It was, they just said, I'm not compatible. Because it was, you know, really the issue was the lordship of Christ. And they didn't consider my allegiance to Christ as being compatible with military service, obviously. They want to make sure their your allegiance is only to them. And today I'd make very clear that that's the issue. I wasn't quite so clear there, but that was what was underlying the whole thing. Uh, rather than get into t tangential things like some of the nonsense that goes on. You know, just keep focused on that. It is the Lordship of Christ. He is Lord. 
And if you command something that violates the Word of God or command me not to do something that God requires, I will obey God and not you. And that will probably solve the problem. <laughs> you might find yourself on punishment duty for a while, though. Yeah. Of course, I don't know if they even have people that clean the latrines or the bathrooms anymore in the military. That's probably all done by contractors. How can you go to war? What if your contractors don't want to support you where you're going? Then you got no food, no laundry, no nothing. They don't even have mechanics nowadays, from what I understand. That, like, the mechanics for the, the jet engines and everything else, uh, they don't have, the military doesn't do that themselves. When I was in there, they trained uh, enlisted people, that you, you recruited you, and then they train you for these various skills, like I was in computer repair. And they were, uh, not that they used me in that, but, but they trained as jet engine mechanics or radar technicians or all kinds of things, not just operators, technicians, uh, those who repair it, fix it. So the, the, apparently they don't do that anymore. That allows them to uh, ha have a lot more people in the military that, than as actually in the military. So rather than having uh, most of the military personnel being support positions, now they focus on combat positions, and they that way they inflate the. It's a way to get around things. Okay, so non-participation. See, a lot of times, I think the best way to deal with the world is just say, no, I'm not going to join you in this. You go do that. That's all you want to do. But I'm not going to join you with it. It's just sort of like, it, but it can come an issue. It's like, a, especially if you're in business or something, the, the Christian baker that refuses to bake the... Uh, the cake that celebrates gay marriage, for example. He said, no, I simply will not participate in that. There's a bakery down the street that doesn't mind. But, of course, when people are going looking to, uh, to persecute and harass Christians, they don't care that they can just go down the street and that the guy will sell them a cake for other purposes. They don't care. They're just looking uh, to take, because they hate Christians. They just hate Christians. You're not really doing any, them any harm at all. You're just not participating in their wickedness. And the Bible warns us we'll be persecuted for that. All who desire to live righteously shall be persecuted. But you don't have to go looking for it. It'll come looking for you. Uh, but I think uh, I, this year, the, the elections just, just utter, the, the utter corruption of it all has just become so obvious that I can't in good, and I realize that you can't fix it. No matter who you elect, it's already compromised. You have to be compromised in order to be part of the system. You have to swear allegiance to the system. I won't do it. So, and I don't think Christians should involve themselves with it. Uh, I can think of nothing in the history of America where, where Bible-believing Christianity had any influence in the government or in the culture. None. Now, there's been lots of stories, lots of propaganda about this being a Christian country. But show me some real examples of where Christians, by participating in the, in the uh, government, in the electoral process, actually made meaningful, lasting change. Real, biblical change. That's not what God does. That's the world. We're told not to have fellowship with the world, to come out from the world, didn't I have that once at 
Oh, I didn't. I was thinking of, of, uh, you know, we're. I'll have to look it up again. Second Corinthians chapter six. Starting at, uh, let's see, where does that start? Not there. I've read this before, but it says, he says here, he's talking to the Corinthians. He says, uh, first Corinthians. He says, uh, Second Corinthians here, but the church in Corinth, which was a mess. This, this would be like having your convention in Orange County, California. <laughs> like the Southern Baptist just did. Why would you go there? Why? Just think about think about that. So, so people have to come from all over the country if they want to participate in the convention. Why wouldn't you have it in a central location? Like Iowa or something. Missouri. Nebraska. Arkansas. Uh. I, I sort of wrinkled my nose because we used to drive through Arkansas often in the part of the state we drove through. I had this drove through had a smell of sulfur. There's actually they apparently refine sulfur there too. Not quite sure why it is, but it just has that that smell of rotting eggs. My goodness. Nothing about those, and that that was just that particular area of the state. So. I hope. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us. Now, Corinth was a moral basket case as far as the church. But you are restricted by your own affections, your own desires. What you love. Now, in return for the same, I, I speak as to children. You also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Reference to the Old Testament commandment that you are not to yoke together, harness together a donkey and an ox. It'd be like harnessing together a, uh, uh, a four-wheeler, and a caterpillar tractor. They just can't work together. They're not suited for each other. Now, uh, farmers especially used to, and others would harness together multiple caterpillar tractors so they could work as a team. But you cannot harness together dissimilar things, things of a different nature, of a different purpose. See, a donkey has a different purpose than an ox. A donkey is not a plowing animal. Now, people, small people, <laughs> could ride them. Poor donkeys. I was in the Middle East uh, in Israel. I saw you know, an Arab, I assume, uh, in typical Arab garb in, in Jerusalem area there. I looked out the bus window and saw him riding his donkey. And I mean, the poor donkey. I mean, a donkey's not much bigger than my dog. And you're talking about maybe a 100-pound animal or a little more, and you're putting, a, say, a 125, 150-pound man on him. Poor donkey. It's not, it's not like a mule, a donkey. Or in the, old, in, in the King James, an ass. Do not uh, be unequally yoked with unbelievers. We're not of the same nature. We're not the same kind. We are new creatures in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. It's so easy to talk a long time on YouTube. Do not be unequally yoked. 
together. It's normally interpreted as don't marry a non-believer. That's true, but it, it means more than that. Do not be in partnership with. Do not be bound together. This would apply to military service. Why are you being bound together with unbelievers? You're, you are enslaving yourself. You're selling yourself into bondage to the government of the United States for four years or whenever the war ends, or two years or whatever it is, or until they decide they're done with you. Why are you selling yourself to the government? When Christ, when the, when the scripture clearly says in the New Testament, do not become the slaves of men. Slave of Biden, doulos of Biden, servant, if you prefer. Bound servant. You've contracted yourself out. You've sold yourself. Your body, maybe your soul, to the government. To do with as they please. Including, have you destroyed? Have you died in a overseas adventure for ungodly purposes? Even if they dress it up with a little lipstick. Do you really want to do that? Do you really want to discard the Lordship of Christ? in service to Joe Biden and friends. I don't think that's wise. I didn't think that was wise under other presidents and especially not wise today. Because Joe Biden is an antichrist, a servant of Satan. Manifestly so. And a Christian that doesn't understand that simply is not paying attention or does not want to understand that. Do not does not understand the scriptures. And what's that you, somebody that's been thoroughly uh, has thoroughly imbibed the world. There are Christians. They call themselves liberal Christians or progressive Christians or something that have drunk deeply of the world and its values and try to put the name of Christ on top of it. But it doesn't work. It's not true. Same as conservatism. That is not Christianity. A Christian stands apart from the world, both liberal and conservative, both socialist and capitalist. You stand apart. You judge all things by the word of God. That means nobody likes you. <laughs> For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? The world is lawless. It does not even seek to obey God. But Christians are righteous. We're, we're righteous because we believe Christ. And Christians seek to live in obedience to God. Not to make them righteous, but because they have been made righteous. What communion has light with darkness? We are the light of the world. The world is darkness. Do you believe that? Do you actually believe the scriptures? You call yourself a Christian? Do you actually believe... The Apostle Paul. And what accord, what agreement, what arrangement has Christ with Belial, the devil? Or what part is a believer with an unbeliever? What part, what portion has a believer with an unbeliever? And yet you, you want to yoke yourself in bondage to the military or to a corrupt police group or you know, any kind of thing in the government, oath-bound. The scripture says, do not swear oaths. Jesus said, do not swear an oath. James says, do not swear an oath. Because you think it's good? 
You want to disobey God because you want to do what you think is good. Disobey Christ. Bind yourself in a legislature and participate in that corruption, that dirty dealing, that bribery, that whole system that is institutionally corrupt after all these years. You can't do anything if you don't play the game. You're not going to represent Christ there unless you're going to get up and use your time to speak, to proclaim the gospel, to call the, the government, to call the legislature, to call everybody to repentance. Are you going to do that? Where is the Christian who gets themselves elected who does that? Can you imagine the uproar? How dare they? It would be the same response that the men of Sodom had to Lot when he tried to rebuke them, gently rebuke them. Oh, brethren, don't do this thing when they, were, when they wanted to rape the angels. Bad plan. Bad plan. As they soon found out. You have no fellowship. See, Lot thought he could have fellowship with the inhabitants of Sodom. You can't. What was the result? God had to send two angels to drag Lot and his daughters out, and his wife didn't make it because her heart turned her gaze back to Sodom. That's where my house is. That's where my friends are. Oh, I love their little theater and the garden club. You love Sodom, you share in the judgment. The book of Revelation says, Come out of her, my people, talking about Babylon the Great, lest you partake in her sins and share in her judgment. You think you can, can serve in Congress or the Senate or the White House without partaking in the sins of that entire organization and institution? The very fact that you swear an oath of allegiance is to violate the Word of God. You're swearing an oath not to Christ. And even then you'd be in violation because you don't have the power to fulfill your words. You can't say with certainty what will come out of your mouth or what you will do because you're not God. What agreement has the, has the temple of God with idols? Washington's full of idols. The White House Rotunda is full of idols. I wonder if George Floyd is still there. Does the, 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 does the Congress, the, the Democratic uh, leadership still come out to the rotunda and, and kneel before the image of George Floyd? Or have they gone on to a different God? That's an amazing picture. I think it's actually on video, too. And then Pelosi being unable to stand that kneeling before the image of George Floyd, a convicted felon that died of uh, overdose. Really, that's what really killed him. That's what the uh, coroner found. Was it fentanyl? Had enough to kill a horse in him? I feel sorry for the guy. You should turn to Christ. For you are the temple of the living God. The temple is only holy because God dwells in it. 
what right have you to take the temple of God, as, as Paul talks about in your body? He's talking about the, the, the issue of fornication or, or joining yourself with a harlot, which was really common in, in Corinth. What right do you have to take the temple of God, well, that which belongs to God? If, when you give yourself to Christ, you have given yourself to Christ. You're no longer your own. You belong to him. Not my fault this isn't taught in most churches. You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. My people. Not belonging to the world. Therefore, the therefores in the Bible are important. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. It's also a quote from the Old Testament from the promises of the New Covenant. To me, the best thing in this world to do is to not participate in much of what it does. The problem with Corinth is they had desires. They loved the stuff of the world. And they were filled with the flesh. They were still babes. They hadn't grown up at all in Christ. You know, when you're a new believer, at first you're you're like filled with the Spirit, and you're you don't really have that much trouble. But then you find the flesh is still there, and you're going to have a lifelong struggle with that. Hopefully, as you mature it'll become not so much of a problem in some ways. Other ways, it'll be there. You're not... It, it's just part of living in this world, in these bodies. Sin dwells in our mortal body. As long as you're in your mortal body, you can sin. But if we abide in faith in the Lord, sin does not have dominion. It doesn't have lordship. Why would you give lordship over yourself to the world? Why would you participate in that which is of the world and is not of God and cannot bring any really good result? Like an election, what exactly will it accomplish? Oh, if we don't vote for somebody other than Biden, Biden will get back in office. Well, God is judging America right now. The last election, it was pretty obvious that America would determine its fate. It would determine whether it's going to uh, choose Joe or re-elect Trump. I don't think that was a very good choice, but that's usual. The, the devil always gives us two bad choices. That way he wins either way. But I don't know. He said, better for Christians. I think it's better. The scripture tells us here to don't have fellowship with them. We're not of the world. If I were to go down to Mexico and decide I'm going to participate in the Mexican elections and campaign for, for so, Oberon or somebody else, the Mexicans would look at me, what are you doing? You're not a Mexican. Your citizenship's not here. I'd be interfering in their election. You're an American. You're not a Mexican. How come we think we can participate in the elections in America when our citizenship is in heaven and Christ is our king? 
not only do we uh, really have no business since we're not, our citizenship is not here, but we also insult our king by mixing with the world and putting our affections in the things of the world and not believing that God can take care of things. Praying that God would withhold judgment from America. Why? Why? When judgment's meant to bring people back to Christ, back to God, to cause them to reconsider. No, we're afraid, well, it might affect my savings account. It might affect my lifestyle. It might affect a lot of things in my life. I don't want to be uncomfortable. Judgment's uncomfortable. So are we concerned about the will of God? Are we concerned about our own will? What we want. That we don't want to see these things happen because it'll bring problems for us. And we'd rather avoid difficulty than obey Christ. Again, the historic evangelical view in America for since the beginning was Christians stay clear of government because it's a dirty business. Always been a dirty business in spite of the nonsense they teach you in school. They don't teach you about how things really make. They teach you, well, they make sausage there but they don't show you how sausage is made and what goes into it. In principle, this is how it's supposed to work. That's not how it works. It's of the world, and it works the way the world does. Powered by sin, powered by greed, powered by the lust of power, by the lust of the flesh, by fornication. Sin works. Sin powers the world. But it doesn't power the church. The church lives by faith in God. In the power of the Holy Spirit. What does that have to do with Washington? Or your state capital? Christians can do more for the kingdom of God by standing apart and declaring the gospel, standing for the truth, standing for righteousness and holiness, and being an example of what it means to live as a Christian than to wallow in the mire of this world, to join the fights of this world. You can't accomplish the will of God doing that because it's of the world. And the world is the enemy of Christ and the domain of darkness and of the devil. All the world. Do you believe that? If you do, you believe the Bible. If you don't believe that, well, you simply don't believe the Word of God.